Hey guys, Coach Alex here from Fast Fitness Tips. Today we're going to talk about a secret of the bike industry nobody seems to be talking about. That is, unless you go onto various online forums where it's discussed indefinitely. Yes, today we're going to talk about the Q factor. Now, the Q factor simply refers to the distance across your cranks. You know, when you thread the pedals in, the pedals go into the cranks, don't they? And the distance to the outside of the cranks is known as the Q factor. Now, of course, on top of that, you've got the distance of the pedal axle and where your cleats are sitting on the pedal. So ultimately, where your feet are sitting either side of the bike is actually a wider metric called the stance width. It used to be called thread width. Now we call it stance width. Now, what is the importance of the Q factor? I hear you ask. What's the reason we're talking about Q factor? Well, if you've Cast your mind back to the rivalry between Ulrich and Armstrong in the 80s and 90s. Ulrich used this Walza bike, Walza time trial bike, which had a specifically narrow Q factor. And Armstrong asked Trek to copy that and apparently spent hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of dollars in the redesign of the Trek bike in order to narrow his Q factor, apparently under 130 millimeters, you know, across those cranks. So there's no doubt that the Q factor does influence actually aerodynamics on the road. Now, how much? Well, have a think about that. How significant is it? Now, there are other factors and other reasons that we need to consider why the Q factor can't just be as narrow as possible. Otherwise, we'd all be riding around on super narrow like track bike with Q factors of around 130 millimeters. The reason, of course, bikes can't have super narrow Q factors is partly related to hub design. Now, of course, if you think about the bicycle hub, you know, that controls the stability of the cranks, then the stability is really related to the cross-sectional area, isn't it? So there's not much a bike manufacturer can do to stabilize the cranks other than make a large cross-sectional area, i.e. A, a huge, you know, huge crank like the BB30 design, or it can be elongated, you know, horizontally elongated like BB90, for example, BB86 or BB90. Now that does have an effect of making the, the frame, the bottom bracket frame shell longer, larger, and that can't be good for aerodynamics. Now, that doesn't mean to say, however, the Q factor necessarily gets wider because the actual distance between the cranks is determined by the chain line. Have a look at this diagram. Now, the bottom bracket shell may be large, but the ch chain line still got to be good. So what is actually determining this trend towards a larger Q factor over the years? Well, it's really what's happening in the rear of the bike, i.e. the rear axle. You know, if you think of road bikes as being 130 mil rear axle, they've gone to 135 mil rear axle to accommodate 11 and now 12 speed cassettes. And also don't forget your disc brake rotor as well. So there's a trend for the axle, both in road and mountain. You know, we've got this new standard in mountain bikes, haven't we? The 148 Boost. So 148 boost has caused the rear axle of mountain bikes also to be pushed out. Now, the effect of pushing that out is there's an issue for the rear stays. Basically, the rear stays become quite close to the crank arm and more particularly close to your foot. So your foot can actually, the rear of your foot can actually rub on the rear stay, causing this kind of uh, erosion of the paint on the rear stay, which is never good for the look of any bike, let's face it. So what we can say then is there's a tension, a compromise, if you like, between narrow Q factors and narrow stance width, which would favor aerodynamics, and larger Q factors and larger stance widths, which would favor, let's say, practical bike design, you know, accommodating those large cassettes and other gubbins at the back of your bike. So how do we resolve this? And what is the effect for the rider? You know, what is the actual effect? Well, I guess there's a few things to consider. One the bike that you're riding must be comfortable for you. In other words, your biomechanical efficiency must be good. Two, the bike must be reasonably efficient as doing its job. And if you're riding like me, you know, road or TT, then you want that bike to be, 
you know, as aerodynamic as, as possible. You want there to be a really kind of narrow profile, if at all possible, but not one that compromises your power output either. That's a major consideration because there comes a point where you're riding, let's say, too wide or too narrow a stance width then you're going to have a problem putting down the power. Just like on the TT bike, if your hip flexor angle is too acute, you know, you won't be able to put down the power despite being in a super aero position. So let's put some numbers on this. And if you look up a chart of Q factors in relation to double chain sets, then you're going to find uh, measurements around 150 millimeters. And if you look up triple around 160 to 170. So here's a little chart ranking the Q factors from low to high across track, road, and mountain bike. And you can see the lowest that I could find for standard setup was Campagnolo record pista track coming in about 131 millimeters. On the road, you know, SRAM, SRAM Red, SRAM Force, you're talking about around about 145 millimeters. And if you're talking about mountain bike, you're talking about roughly 160 to 170 millimeters. And fat bike, by the way, is coming in around 200 millimeters. So Q factor can be quite appreciable. Now on top of that, of course, you've got your stance width, which we've mentioned a few times, but the stance width is effectively the Q factor plus your pedal displacement. So how long your pedal axles are and also really where your cleats are. So Certain pedals like Speedplay come with aftermarket axles that you can screw in up to um, five different lengths. The same for the Mercury pedals from Tri-Rig, you know, the same thing. You can, you can basically boost them out via spacers up to additional nine millimeters. So certainly if you start with a narrow Q factor, you can get wider and that would mean that you can achieve a fit that's comforting for you. Now, can we put some figures on this in terms of comfort? Well, I can't, but Q Factor guru Xavier Disley has looked at this in the lab studying 12, then 24 riders. And he looked at comfort based on lateral knee displacement, according to Q Factor. And he found that a wider Q Factor wasn't really the most comfortable for most people. Now, you as an individual might find a wider Q Factor comfortable for you. But he found most people actually would prefer a narrow Q Factor under 150 millimeters. Now, if you allowed people to select their own self-selected Q Factor, the one that they personally found most comfortable, they went towards around 140 millimeters and they found in the lab, Disley et al. found in the lab, that this was preferential in terms of measured lateral knee displacement and preferential in terms of gross mechanical efficiency. In other words, putting out the power is actually better when you're able, when you're able to select the Q factor that suits you. Perhaps no surprise there. So here's a question for you guys. How do you modify your Q factor or your stance width? Well, I've already mentioned one way, which is to change the pedal axle. Another way is to put washers in between the cranks and the pedal axle. But be careful there, because if you stack them really way out, you may reduce the amount of rigidity of the axle, you know, in the crank. And that area, the axle and the crank, gets a lot of force. You can get these little metal extenders, which take it out about, you know, a centimeter or so, and they are adjustable in some ways. Now, one thing caught my eye recently, and that was from Sea Otter. I don't know if you guys saw it, but Expedo is coming out with a really interesting new design for a pedal. It's actually a pedal which floats around their axis. So once you screw the pedal axle on, there's an adjustable clip, which allows you to adjust the Q factor up to six millimeters. In my eyes, that's a brilliant little innovation because it doesn't really add to the weight of the pedal and it allows you to find a Q factor that's suitable for you. Well, I say Q factor, I'm talking about stance width now, aren't I? Now in old fashioned terms, the way we used to solve this, of course, is changing the cleat position. And that's fair enough. But if you do push the cleat way to one side, you're going to find your foot is pushing on the pedal in a kind of slightly weird way. In other words, the center line of your foot in the shoe is not pushing with maximal force down on the pedal in the right way. So I would caution using the cleat to push way out, you know, more than a few millimeters each way. But I guess this is an area we're going to have to come to terms with more and more these days. Because certain products are coming to market, you know, I'm thinking of the limits power meter, but now the IQ squared power meter is exactly the same. It screws in to the crank body 
And although they've designed it well so that your pedal axle screws in further to the device, it still pushes out your stance width by around about six millimeters overall. That may or may not be significant to you. You have to test it and see and see whether that's an issue for you. Now, I guess a lot of you will already know most of the basics that I've been talking about so far today. Some of you may be a little bit bored and drifting off, but come on guys, this is Fast Fitness Tips. Let's bring this back to the sharp edge by asking, is there any metrics on performance what performance gain can we possibly get? We talked about comfort, we talked about fit, and yeah, they are vitally important. But if you think of Graham O'Brien on Old Faithful, you know, there's no doubt that Q factor is super narrow. There's something in having a narrow profile on a bike. And if you look at the TT bikes that are on the World Tour right now, you know, look at them in the head-on profile. They virtually disappear from the front. You know, there's a lot to be said from racing on a bike that has a narrow profile. So here's my question for you guys. Does it make a difference in terms of performance? Well, of course it does, but it's actually much more complicated than you think. Now, first of all is the aero gain of being, you know, like squished. If you have a very narrow cue, a very narrow stance width, then you get minimal losses. So this chart here is a chart of losses according to the Q factor of the bike. So this is basically additional watts. Now it is influenced by how many watts you're putting out on the bike. In other words, the faster you go, obviously the more the aero losses, or look at it another way, the more the gains to be had from having a narrow profile. Now this chart here is actually even more interesting in a way. This is the power efficiency of riding a bike with a certain Q, let's say optimized Q factor. Now the ultra optimized Q may be your self selected most comfortable Q, I give you that. But for many bikes, let's take road, the optimal Q if you study in the lab is not your classic 150 millimeters, it's actually less, it's around 130 to 140 millimeters. You know, several authors have now found that studying in the lab, there's an inefficiency by riding too high a Q and too low a Q. So bear with me here, what I'm trying to say is there's both an aerodynamic factor and a power or efficiency, a biomechanical factor that we need to take into account when modeling the Q factor, the optimal Q. But there is a point, a tipping point, where the optimal Q is somewhere in the middle of the Q range because too low and you're getting definitely a biomechanical inefficiency. Too high and you're getting both biomechanical and error inefficiency. So what I'm doing here is I'm modeling across the x-axis various Q factors for identical bikes but the Q factor varies. And across the y-axis that is the power output needed for the rider. So let's say the rider's 150 watt casual recreational rider. If we push that bike Q factor up to 200, we would see that there's a contribution of drag that is about 44 watts above zero, above a zero Q. And there's also a contribution of power, which actually eight watts loss of power because of inefficiency pedaling at 200 rather than their optimal Q. But if we take it down to zero, you think a zero Q would be best. Well, not necessarily because there's a 20 watt penalty in inefficiency pedaling a super, super narrow. I know it's hypothetical. There's no such thing as a zero Q, but this is a model that we get when we extrapolate in a biomechanical inefficiency around a reasonable number in the lab. Okay, let's take another example. Let's take another, let's take an extreme. Let's take a track rider re riding a short sprint event around the track, 666 watts, let's say. Well, you can see now that actually the power efficiency, the biomechanical effect is actually dominant despite them being much faster. And yes, there is a drag loss with higher cues. And definitely, you know, once you start getting above, let's say, you know, one. 60, 170, there's a problem. But you can see here, there's a tipping point. That tipping point is here around 90, 100, 110 maybe. You know, we can calculate the optimal Q for that rider based on both biomechanical and also drag efficiency. Let's do one more example. Let's say, you know, a time trialist going at 333 watts, let's say. Well, we can say that if their Q factor was 120, then we'd have a slight loss compared to zero of 27, and we'd have a biomechanical loss 
120 because biomechanically 120 130 140 on the time trial bike those kind of q ranges are extremely advantageous if you went down to a q factor of 60 should it be available then of course your aero benefit would be great you'd be having only nine watts lost compared to zero but biomechanically you'd lose about 10 watts compared to the optimum Okay guys, I hope I haven't bored you there. What I've done is walk you through what I claimed was a bike industry secret. And yes, I do think it's an area we don't talk enough about. For sure, I know that for decades now, it's been attended to by Ulrich, been attended to by Armstrong, been attended to by Obri, and all current World Tour riders are riding time trial bikes with you know highly optimized wind tunnel frames, which include generally as narrow a queue as possible. But just as going narrow can be a problem, going too wide can be a problem too. You've got to consider biomechanical efficiency, you've got to consider aerodynamics, and you also have to consider fit, comfort, and ability to ride a long distance. So that's my summary run through on Q Factor and Stance Width. If you can support us on Patreon, it would be much appreciated. Any suggestions or comments are very welcome below. Please like or share this video. And until next time, have a great ride, guys. Take care.